Ladies, gentlemen, and Haradrim of all ages, today we had the final developer stream before Season 5 hits next week for the game, as well as the full patch notes of changes coming out afterwards, and as we have already had a decently in-depth look into the main features of Season 5 itself, as well as the PTR that ran ahead of time giving us a lot of information, so today's new announcements were pretty much just entirely based around the changes that have been made since then, or the things that just weren't in the game yet. And you might think that that means that there's not much to talk about, but, well, they've changed pretty much every unit unique in the game, and they told us what they did to them in these patch notes, exactly how each one has changed. Of course, that means that there are literally more than a hundred things to actually talk about, but we'll go over anything that was talked about on the stream of importance, and we'll talk about any of the changes in the form of actual patch notes and anything that is important happening for each class, and we'll go over a few uniques for each class that really sort of stand out in how they've changed and where they will sit in the new version of the game that we'll be playing, but it's worth saying, with all of the uniques that we have, it's going to take a fair amount of math and testing to actually find out what the new best builds are for each class, because these changes to uniques are ridiculous across the board. Without further ado then, let's start from the top with changes made to the new Infernal Horde wave clearing endgame mode. First, changes to how we actually get into this, a main complaint from the PTR was that the Infernal compasses for getting into the mode were just too difficult to actually collect, now they've given them updated drop rates from a number of places, including high chances from Helltide chests, 50% from the item chests, 100% guaranteed from the Mystery and Living Steel chests, as well, there is a 75% drop rate on completion of Nightmare Dungeons and handing in Whispers of the Dead completions too. The general expectation is that you will get 4 or 5 Infernal Compasses per hour, with tiers 4 and above of these actually now dropping naturally from higher tiered Nightmare Dungeons and Pit Runs too. Which means that we don't only have to rely on the Abyssal Scrolls to upgrade them, which is honestly far better. On which note, as well, you can now craft compasses at the Occultist for Sigil Powder and Forgotten Souls, which is also a pretty nice change too. Then we had changes to the gameplay of the Infernal Horde as well, as they've adjusted the difficulty pretty heavily across the board. They've lowered the time per wave, they've increased the spawn rate of enemies in these waved, and upped the difficulty overall of the game mode, but they fixed a bug that was also inflating the health of the bosses at the end too. They've also made pets pick up the currency, which is much better than it was before, and as well they've fully boosted the rewards at the end of this activity as well. First by giving much more Infernal Aether during the event itself, and then by reducing the cost of every chest a significant amount amount, but then also increasing the quality of the rewards within each chest as well, especially notably scaling a lot more aggressively with higher tier versions of the activity. All of this then will be sort of worked around a new reputation system, much like we had with Call of the Wolves in Season 4, but unlike the Season 4 version of this that only gave you reputation from doing Helltide, this one will give you reputation from killing any quote-unquote higher ranking enemy. So still things like Hellboard and Helltide, but also elites or bosses in dungeons or events, strongholds, everything will give some sort of reputation in the game, which is important because not only is the seasonal questline actually unlocked through reaching higher reputation ranks this time around, and the devs also said that you reach higher reputation ranks, you will actually be getting scaling experience increases. So if you want to level quickly, you'll probably want to farm reputation this season. Like last season, along this reputation track, you will also get legendaries, you will get class-specific uniques, especially new ones, and even a resplendent spark right at the end of the track to help you craft a mythic unique of your choice. Past that, then, there is also a new type of sort of mini-dungeon being added in, called Hell's Breach Dungeons. Infernal Hordes, as an activity, are World Tier 3 and 4 only, and will also be added to the Eternal Realm, whereas these, Hell's Breach Dungeon, are in lower world tiers and are seasonal only. These are basically intended to be just a really powerful, farmable activity for those early tiers of gameplay in your early leveling journey, and they specifically said that these were actually designed off of the concept and the sort of density of Domhain Tunnels, and anyone who has specifically grinded XP in this game knows just how good that implies this to be, as that is an excellent dungeon for XP. So that is really neat to hear about, and this should be quite effective. These are essentially just going to be early game mini dungeons that will introduce some of the new mechanics along the way, just sort of an early training wheels walk through the new seasonal stuff going on really, with some good rewards as far as the actual uh, XP and the reputation that you get for doing them. Past that we have some Helltide changes. Baneful Heart amounts increased from PTR, but it's still less than they were in Season 4. Whispers of the Dead will now overlap a lot more effectively together with Helltide. Profane Mind Cages have also been brought back with Season 5, but these now can be stacked up to three times to give you an up to 30 level increase on Helltide enemies, which is super high risk, but also incredibly high reward potential if you can handle it, as now the enemy level cap for XP bonus has been raised to 30 levels above the player, which means if you can handle that type of difference while leveling, it will level you much faster, rather than only being 10 levels above the player as this was locked to before. This means that you're just rewarded more heavily for doing more 
challenging content and as early as you are capable of it. Past that, they've also boosted the drop rate of legendaries on all monsters that are above level 100, specifically in Nightmare Dungeons and also in the Artificer's Pit. They've made Angel Breath a consumable, no longer required for enchanting, which is a great change, really. And then the crowd control duration within the game has been capped at one and a half seconds against the player, pretty much to every single thing that can stun you, which paired with the recent change to allow you to spam potions even while you're stunned should actually make us much more able to deal with stuns as a concept in the game. Then in the PTR, there was a thing going on with world bosses that a lot of people thought was a bug, but they specified that they just forgot to include it in the patch notes, which is that world bosses now have an effect called resilience. So rather than a world boss being a set level that is tied to the world tier, and so you can overlevel it significantly, they now just have normalized damage intake. So they are tankier to higher level players, but also weaker against lower level players. As well, they've done some general changes to the pit. The boss damage of bosses within the pits has been reduced by 66% just in general, which is an incredibly large decrease. But then also to compensate for this, a change that I love that I definitely asked for, and I know a bunch of other people did too last season, which is that the shadow echo attacks that come with the bosses now also apply the torment boss stacks when they hit you. That is in the stacks from the torment boss fights, which increase all damage that you take for each stack that you have. In this activity, the third stack applied should be equal to just taking season four's regular pit boss damage. And honestly, that's a really awesome change that I'm really happy to see. They've also fixed party play within the pit so that all players get the full rewards rather than just the actual host getting them. As well, this is a change that was on the PTR, but they brought it up again. And it's honestly worth talking about because it's just a really good change, which is that end game bosses, the boss ladder bosses can be spawned again and again without having to reload the area and walk through their sort of mini tunnel thing. As well, the beast in ice no longer requires a sigil to summon him and no longer requires you to do a whole ass dungeon before actually getting to see him too. Not to mention that on the eternal realm, you can actually use your old beast and ice sigils if you still have them, which is a nice little sort of overlap they've done. As well for Varshan, the only material required to summon him as season five onwards will be malignant hearts, as in there's only one thing you have to collect for him instead of having to collect four different bits. So now your inventory will just have three more slots, either in your stash or in your actual consumables. As well, the latter bosses won't be dropping rare items anymore at all, instead of just dropping bonus gold to compensate for the items that they will not be dropping. As well, on top of that, tormented versions of these latter bosses will now drop five times as many materials for the bosses that are above them. For example, if you were to kill tormented Varshan, he would drop five eggs instead of one, which he was doing last season. As well, on top of that, it only requires one Stygian stone to summon the tormented bosses now, as opposed to two like it was before, which is honestly just really good, but we'll have to see how frequently these Stygian stones are dropping, because even then the Stygian drop rate was pretty low before in the last season. Moving on from that, we're moving to the actual class changes section, and this is where things are going to get pretty meaty as far as like balance and things like that go. First off, we've got some fixes to classes, some bugs that were fixed, which have actually made classes stronger as a result. First, Necromancer's shielding storm aspect was previously giving them barrier based on their base life instead of maximum life. Now it gives it based on maximum life, which is significantly stronger than it was before, and this will just be used, simple as that. Then the Barbarian has had their Twister Paragon Glyph fixed because it just wasn't working properly to boost Dust Devils, but now is. Earthquake Duration Temper for Barbarian as well was actually weirdly lowering the DPS of Earthquakes when on, and this has been fixed, so any Earthquake-centric builds will get a lot of a boost from this too. And then Trick Attacks for Rogue is no longer able to stack to 39 ranks. This used to be a utility thing that was changed into a damage passive skill within the PTR, but uh, Tempering let you still stack it on because they hadn't changed the Tempering recipe yet, so they've just essentially just made this recipe just gone from the game for now, but it will be brought back with the next patch with that actual affix removed from the manual. Then we have some actual proper class updates, not just bug fixes. They thought barbarians have been too strong for too long, and this is mostly due to them having what they think to be essentially two different class mechanics, being the weapon expertise and the extra weapon slots. So what they've done to compensate for this are main stat changes, which we talked about quite recently. What this does is essentially change the way that the damage increase scales with your main stats, depending on how many weapon slots your class has. Barb gets the lowest increase from main stat, Rogue gets the second lowest, and then the other three classes are matched. So this is actually a really strong way to buff all of the other classes that aren't Barbarian, essentially. Past that as well, Barbarian key passives have been reduced in power just because they were very strong compared to most classes key passives. And otherwise from that, Barb has just gotten a lot of buffs to sort of make up for that. They're trying to still keep a same sort of parity for Barb while moving where the actual power is. For example, they've increased the damage of Hammer of the Ancients by 10% just flat across the board, and increased the way that the rolls work on the Ancestral Force aspect, as well as doubling its damage bonus effect against bosses, which is actually pretty cool. And on top of that, they've 
they've also changed the way that the Hellhammer works, the upheaval unique, on top of, you know, upping the damage of upheaval by 50% in general, and they've made this weapon just so much better. The burning effect on upheaval will now scale with strength with this weapon equipped, and it'll have even higher bonus skill ranks for upheaval, which is really good, as well as having an upheaval size affix, which will also affect the burning, and it's just, as a whole, this is way, way better. I'm really excited about this concept. I love this unique, and it sounds like it's going to be genuinely good now. Then for Sorcerer, there have been just a lot of really big buffs for the uniques, and they said more so than the other classes even, even though everyone's had the uniques buffed, Sorcerer especially. As well, all core and mastery skills for Sorcerer will be doing upwards of 20% bonus damage, which is on top of the changes to the main stat damage scaling as well. Ice Armor Shield amount has been increased as well. The Snow Veiled aspect will now give you damage reduction instead of bonus armor, which it did on the PTR, which is a really, really good change. As well, there's been buffs to the Paragon board for Sorcerer, including increasing the double dip scaling caps like 40% up to 80% for Burning Instinct. For Druid, the Seismic Shift aspect no longer adds a cooldown to Earth Spike, which is great. Honestly, that was the main negative of that aspect, and it was an aspect that I really liked the concept of. They've also increased the damage of Boulder, as well as making Cataclysm now consistently target actual enemies with its lightning strikes, which is a good change to make for sure. Perfect Storm is a key passive has been buffed up to 40% damage increase from 30%, and they've increased the cap on double dip scalers from the Paragon board for Druid as well, with the example being 40% up to 60% for Thunderstruck. As well, on top of that, the Cataclysm unique that was in the PTR has been moved from the glove slot to the ring slot so that you can use it with the Lightning Storm unique. Then we have Rogue, and Rogue has had probably the least amount of changes of everything because they just really like where Rogue is for the most part. What they did was change Flurry a little bit from the way it was in the PTR. They moved some of the damage from Enhanced and Advanced Flurry back into the base skill of Flurry so that you have a bit more adaptability and options with the skill, and the Wind Force unique will no longer knock back enemies at all. Instead, it will knock them down. So it still applies CC, but it's a much more actually useful type of CC that won't have any negative to it. Not to mention that it actually has move speed as an affix on it as a weapon, which is actually pretty cool. Necromancer then has had tempering recipe increases to all of its blood related skills. Blood legendary nodes have just been increased too on the Paragon board with Bloodbath over power damage doubled and Blood Begets Blood damage increased doubled as well. Then you just have a bunch of lucky hit chance increases for Necromancer across the board, so you have an easier time procking your lucky hit bonuses from just using your regular skills. Then past that, we have just so many changes for uniques, and what they gave us during the stream is the best thing that I can give you is a condensed version of this, which is three per class, and then three generic uniques as well. But it's important to note that every single unique has been changed for the most part, and they are all in the patch notes if you want to look at them and look at specific ones and what they do, but a lot of parts of the classes are just different because of this, so this is really Really impactful. So for the most part, as a general sort of across the board thing that they've done with them, the general power level of the bottom text on a unique, the actual unique effect has been increased as a whole. Affixes have as a whole. The affixes on uniques as well have changed massively. They also break a normal item changed massively, and they break the normal item rules now. For example, you can have a non-boot inherent affix on a pair of boots, or you can have a unique that has multiple inherent affixes. They gave us a few examples of how this looks, and it's pretty obvious to me, once we've seen them, that uniques are going to be extremely good in this season, and probably beyond, based on all of these changes they're making here. So we'll start with the generic uniques then. Penitent Greaves, that used to have a 12 to 20... Penitent Greaves, the actual damage roll to chilled enemies used Penitent Greaves, the actual damage roll you could get on this that increased to chilled enemies used to be 12 to 15%. Now it's 12 to 25%, which is quite the increase. And not only does it have the old inherent affix that increased the movement speed that you have after evading for one second, but now that's been increased to two seconds of increased movement speed. But also there's a second inherent affix that gives you unhindered movement so you can walk through enemies and not be affected by crowd control for those two seconds after a dodge as well, which is really, really cool. Then we have the Fists of unique, and these have gone from being sort of weird and niche to being honestly extremely powerful for the glove slot. All the lucky hit chances effects have been sort of condensed into one. It used to have four lucky hit affixes. Now it has one that is a lucky hit chance at random to apply any crowd control effect in the game. As well, it has attack speed as an affix, it has crit chance as an affix, and it has lucky hit chances as an affix too. So it's just a really, really strong offensive item now, especially when you consider the old unique effect already being very good for a lot of builds. 
Then past that, we have the Grandfather. Mythic Unique has had its infinite durability sort of affix move from being part of the weapon to being an inherent affix, so it can't be messed with by things like greater affixes or like masterworking. And now it's been replaced on the weapon itself with just a really big flat damage increase. 300% is a really big increase there. Not to mention how that would look with things like masterworking or greater affixes applied on top. Then we have more specific ones for each class, starting with Barbarian, we had Battle Trance, and the main change for this was that the actual effect of it, the unique effect, now not only gives you attack speed as you stack up Frenzy, but also bonus damage, which is really good. It also gets duelist ranks on the item itself, as well as just better affixes in general. Then we have the Ring of the Ravenous, and this is another pretty big change for Barb's uniques as well. This has had skill ranks of Rend now added on top of the brawling ranks that are on the ring, and it also has the Rend duration of the unique effect doubled to an eight second increase instead of the four second increase that it used to be, which is really big for stacking bleeds quickly. Not to mention that the effect now is limited to proccing once per second, whereas before it was once per four seconds. So the charge bleed build will be significantly better as will any sort of variance of a brawling bleed build. Then we have changes to Fields of Crimson as well. The inherent affix on this was changed from crit damage, which doesn't really overlap with bleed well, to being vulnerable damage, which it stacks incredibly well with it. Then they also had enhanced rupture explosion size affix on the actual weapon, which is really cool to see. It changes the way that the skill works sort of inherently. And then we have a big damage to bleeding enemies affix on it now too, like a very, very high scaling one. Past that, we have Sorcerer's unique changes. There is the Staff of Endless Rage, which has gained new affixes, including fireball projectile speed, which is just sort of absolutely insane, honestly. Then there's also a chance for fireball to cast twice, which is, you know, an old tempering roll that is now also on this weapon, which is really big. Not to mention it also has a lot of fireball bonus ranks that it can roll, which is pretty big too. And then the Gloves of Illuminator unique, which pairs with this extremely well, now has fireball attack speed that rolls higher than any other attack speed would roll naturally without this specificity. Then you also, which is really big, gain mana when fireball explodes, which is a really cool change to a build that was otherwise quite mana hungry and difficult to sustain. As well, the roll on the effect itself now goes down to a 0% damage decrease, so that it does the same amount of damage as a regular fireball, which is honestly really good if you can get that roll. So essentially the goal of this setup between these two uniques is to create a sort of fireball machine gun build, and that just sounds awesome to me. That's gonna be a really good build. Then we also had the blue rose ring unique, which has had a change to gain a chance for ice spikes to explode twice affix, which is really cool, as well as a really big ice spike damage increase from the original one too, as well as gaining general cold damage and crit chance on top of that as well. Then we had the changes to uniques for Druid, including the Waxing Gibbous unique. The crit effect from Stealth Break Duration has been increased from a 2.5 second duration window to four seconds at a maximum roll. As well, it has an affix that makes Blood Howl give you stealth, which is an incredible change to this as it allows you to break stealth without having to kill enemies. That makes this actually work against bosses or larger health enemy encounters rather than only really working on trash and it makes Shred just a much stronger build in general just from that one singular change. Then we have the Great Staff of the Crones, which has added an affix to make Storm Strike chain to bonus targets, and this is honestly looking really, really good. Then the final Druid unique change that we're going over here is Storm's Companion, with an affix that gives you an increased lucky hit chance for the Pack Leader Spirit Boon, which is honestly massive for companion-based builds, and considering other changes they've made to companions, this is honestly going to be just really, really huge. Then we have the Rogue unique changes that they showed us properly here. Eaglehorn has had a change to the actual inherent affix on it too, which is now vulnerable damage, making it much stronger just as a base. As well, it now has an affix on it that's essentially the penetrating shot cast twice chance temper, just part of the unique. And it also has a large amount of penetrating shot skill ranks that it can roll as well as malice ranks as a passive too. Not to mention the effect on the unique itself has just been increased dramatically. Then the Word of Hakan, Reign of Arrows unique, which is one of my favorite ones conceptually, now also gives Reign of Arrows the Arrow Storm benefits, which is really cool. It also has a really big ultimate damage affix on it, which is just a really high value of it, and a chance for Reign of Errors to double cast, which is absolutely hilarious to think about how that would work with an ultimate skill. Then they've got Saboteur's Signet as well. They've given you a massive grenade damage increase affix, stun grenade size, as well as energy when stun grenade explodes, which is just really crazy because you drop a bunch of these every time you use stun grenades. So that will be a really good way to just sort of play if you want to gain energy regen really quickly. Not to mention that the ring also has cooldown reduction on an affix of it for a ring of all things, and it's now affected by all core skills on the unique effect itself, not solely flurry, which is just really good changes overall. Then finally, we had a couple of uniques for Necromancer 
as well. For Cruor's Embrace, Blood Surge will now drain two bonus times from Elites as an affix, which is a surprisingly cool version of this. As well, this has ranks of Tides of Blood on the actual item now. Death Speaker's Pendant now gives you Essence per enemy that is being drained by Blood Surge as well. These obviously are supposed to synergize together, and that's a really cool way to get a bunch of energy for a blood-focused build in Necromancer. Not to mention, this also gives you many bonus Blood Surge ranks on the item too, and higher coalesced blood ranks than it did before. Then we have the Greaves of the Empty Tomb. This will now give you a 30% sever size increase. It will also give you sever projectile double cast chance, and these are boots by the way. As well, the inherent affixes are plus four dodge charges, and you get Desecrated Ground for free after dodging. Not to mention, they also gave us just a little bit of extra sort of stuff to play around with conceptually for Necromancer, which is a legendary aspect, Aspect of the Creeping Mist, which gives you 35% increased cooldown reduction for your Evade specifically, as well as making it so entering and exiting Blood Mist resets your Evade charges, and if you Evade during Blood Mist, you will go double the distance of your normal Evade. So this aspect essentially just gives you an insane amount of mobility, especially if you have boots that give you bonus dodge charges, because it will reset all of your darts charges when you enter or exit Blood Mist, not just one, which is a really good combination. Then finally, with the stream fully covered, as that's pretty much everything that was talked about on the stream, we do also have the patch notes themselves, and for this, there wasn't a whole lot that was changed that we weren't talking about here, but I will just sort of scroll down the unique section so you can see everything that's going on. As we wrap up here, you can pause if you want, you can go and check out the patch notes if you want to see it in more detail, but I did want to actually show everything on screen at least a little bit, even if it's just sort of quick. And that just about does it for today then, everyone. Just a massive amount of changes for the game going into Season 5 for Diablo 4. They've changed the Infernal Horrors, they've given us a lot of more detail on what the actual sort of seasonal progression will be, they've told us about the sort of mini dungeons that we'll be doing a lot of in World Tier 1 and 2, I imagine, and honestly, it's all looking pretty good. The main star of the show, obviously, is the massive amount of changes to uniques, and the ways that that's just going to completely shift up the meta of what is strong and what is not for every class. Honestly, it's hard to say what's going to be the best for each class until we get our hands on it, but th just know that things are very different and builds are going to feel different in Season 5 than they ever have up until this point, pretty much no matter what you're actually going to play. That's it, everyone. I hope you've all enjoyed this sort of breakdown of the stream and the patch notes, and I hope you enjoy actually playing the game when it's ready to come out for Season 5, too. Like if you liked the video, subscribe to the notification bell for more, and most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay sweet. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye <laughs>